Hi, so as the slide says, I'm going to be talking about architecture with standalone components. But before we get into it, I want to talk a little bit of history with Angular. So when Angular 2 was being developed, it started off focused on components, but then Angular 2 release Canada 5 came along, and that changed everything. NG modules were introduced. Now, NG modules weren't all bad. They, they created the architectural patterns that helped to define Angular and created what it is today. But as was mentioned earlier today, NG modules also had that com increased complexity for barrier to entry. And it was quick, quite quickly became one of the most uh, voted issues for making them optional and going back to just having components. So before we get into it all, I'd just like to introduce myself. I'm Colin Ferry. I'm a senior software engineer at Narwhal, and I work on the Angular plugin for NX. My pet projects at the moment with it are module federation support for Angular and standalone component support, which is why I'm talking about this today. So standalone components is what we all wanted, or at least what the majority of us wanted when, when standalone, or sorry, when ng modules became a thing. And they're very easy to actually use. You just create a property called standalone true, and then your component can act on its own without an ng module. But what benefit does this really give us as developers? And put simply, it's a simpler application development. We're removing the ng module, which is kind of like the middleman, which sets up our component, it sets up the providers, it sets up any other imports we need for the directives or components that we use. So by removing that step, it just leads to a much simpler application development. So let's look at some of the differences between the ng module approach and the new standalone component approach. As we can see here, something that we're probably very familiar with, we have a component that is declared and exported by an ng module. The ng module has stated that it needs to import a common module, and that's all required for the component just to work. But in comparison, for standalone components, we no longer need that ng module. We just tell the component that it's a standalone component, and then to let that ngf directive work, we just import the common module directly to the component. So now that we have our component, how do we actually use it somewhere? Well, again, something we're probably very familiar with in an ng module approach, we have to create an R module for the component that wants to use the component we just created. It needs to import the ng module for that other component, and then it needs to declare our new component that we're trying to use it with on. For standalone components, all we do is import our previous component and do our second component, and it's straightforward. So much simpler, we take out that whole extra step of having to declare modules and hook them together. Writing has also become different, so it becomes easier. But to begin with, we would have had our root level writing module, which would set up the for root for router mo router module, and it would have our lazy loaded uh, routes to child routes, which would be inside an another ng module. So we can start to see a pattern of how ng modules are all interconnected with each other. With standalone components and the standalone APIs, we can now just declare a constant, which is the routes definition, routes definition, sorry, and then we can have provide router, which is used at the root level, and that can be used to lazy load your constant file, and rather than actually having an ng module. So we would use a dynamic import to import the file, and then we use the dot .len syntax to resolve the constant. Now, I did notice something interesting coming up in Angular, and that's that if we now, it's not released yet, but if we define the constant as a default export from the my rights file, eventually we'll be able to use low children and just have a dynamic import, and Angular will resolve the default export. Testing has also become much easier. I'm going to show both of these side by side just to help a bit. So in an engine module approach, our component would have had to be declared inside our configure testing module for testbed, along with anything else that it needed. So if we were using mat button or if we had providers that we needed set up, it would all have to be declared here in this configure testing module. But in a standalone component approach, because our component already imports what it needs, when we go to test the file, all we need to do is import the component. And then we can still provide, say, overrides for providers for mock services or things like that. But it, we don't have to go through and find all the providers, all the modules that it needs to work. And finally, one of the last changes is actually bootstrapping an application. So originally, this was split across two files. It would have been your main TS file and your app module file. Because your main TS file would have told 
the platform browser to bootstrap a module, and that module was app module, so the rest of it was the rest of the bootstrapping happened in the app module, which defined or declared the component, and then also said, okay, we need to bootstrap this component. With standalone components, it all merges into one file, so it's all in the main TS file, and we use the new bootstrap application API. We tell it the standalone component we want to bootstrap, and then we can provide some root level providers here. So this is where we could provide our router using the provide router API. But on the what the talk is mostly about, so what is component first architecture? Well, I started thinking about this architecture approach when standalone components was in request for comments stage, because if we were to move towards a standalone component approach for application development, we needed to fill the void that NG modules had created for how we architect our applications. And essentially, the way I looked at it was when we look at applications, we would see our NG module first, and then we'd move on to your component because it's been declared there. Whereas for now, it's going to be components are always going to be at the top level. And because of that, I created this kind of definition where it's the concept that your application is entirely controlled by your components. There's no middleman anymore doing some setup. Everything is, is set up and controlled by your components themselves. And there's four main pillars to this. So there's the standalone components and all their declarables, such as your pipes and your directives. There's component-led state management. Essentially, this is just to say that the state management for a component is lives close by and it's not happening somewhere that it's difficult to find. We have a dedicated routes file or component which specifies the routing throughout your application or if you're using lazy lo loading for each feature that you might be lazy loading. And then finally, reduce provider and direction which can be caused by ng modules creating providers that a component, when you open a component file, you can't see straight away. So essentially, applications should be a composition of standalone components, pipes, and directives, or all our uh, services and things like that as well. But because we now only use standalone components and pipes throughout our whole application, we can see directly when we open a component or a pipe or a directive what it needs to operate. So the reasoning become, becomes more straightforward about how our application is functioning. Testing becomes a lot easier, debugging becomes easier, and I feel like dev tools can be smarter. And this is where I think it's going to be key. I could get to the stage because components and pipes need to import using a TypeScript import. We could use static analysis to analyze our application and build out a dependency graph of our actual components and pipes and directives, which could then lead to even smarter analysis and changes throughout our application. We could also use it for refactoring. So if we needed to change a directive, we could easily see what's affected by making a change to that directive. We can see where it's been imported and what all components will be impacted by that change. So the reduced provider and direction is basically that services that should be used globally and be single, then we provide them in root. Otherwise, we provide them directly in the component metadata. So we can see straight away that this is not a singleton. It's been provided here. We just reduce that in the direction of having to go find the NG module that the component is declared on or the pipe is declared on. And it just makes it a lot easier to reason about and we can reduce bugs that are related to multiple instances. Consider you've got a service that you think is global, but you are starting to see some bugs where it seems like it's not. We can just do a find references and we can see exactly where what component's been provided on. And we can then make it a, a conclusion of whether it should be provided there and it's acting correctly. So it all just helps with this idea of making it easier to debug and reason about our application. And moving on to the dedicated routes file. So every feature domain should have an entry point, which is your routes file or component. So it's easy then to see how we move about the application, how a user might route across our application. But it could be improved if we use something like the Angular component router, where it's a declarative uh, router. We create a component, and the component we use tags to set up how it looks, and it just kind of fills the philosophy of a bit better where it's a component that's controlling all our components. We can see kind of a, a directory structure here of how that might look. You can see that you've got your app, you've got each of your folders for your features, and right at the very top level you can see the routes that is created and will be used throughout that feature. And then on the, the state management, so I would recommend using a tool like NGRX Component Store. Each component can manage its own state where necessary, or it could use a parent state. 
and it can be provided to component and then children have access to it. And there's this indirection about where state is actually being managed for a certain component. You're not dispatching an action then have to try and find some store that's handling that action. And global state manage management can still be achieved. I think Alex is going to speak about this tomorrow in his talk, the use cases of NGRX component store. But if you use provider en route, then your component store can still be used globally. And then we can use it at a feature level as well for each feature and then each, <coughs> so each component of that feature can then just use your feature store. Everything becomes a lot more easy to reason about and we can see, we sort of reduce that idea of just put everything into the global store and we can keep things more separated by domain. So we put all these concepts together at an example directory structure would look like this. Going through to your application, it's very straightforward to see how it's set up. Your, root, your entry component to a feature, the routing throughout your feature, and then where the management of data is happening for that feature. And NX can help with this. So NX offers generators that allow you scaffolding of code from the command line, but if you prefer a GUI, we've got the NX console and VS Code. And there's also standalone component support within NX now, so we can easily build out that core architecture. But NX also makes it a lot easier to follow domain-driven design. So features could be split into domains. Those domains could be split into workspace libraries. Those libraries can be generated using the library generator. And because those libraries support standalone components, we can get our standalone component and our entry roots file straight away, which I can show you right now quickly. So I've got an NX workspace here. It's <coughs> empty bar the Angular plugin. So if I wanted to generate a standalone application, so an, an Angular application that, that uses standalone components from the start. We just pass the standalone flag. Sorry. And then we, <clears throat> we want to set up routing for it, so we pass the routing flag. And we can see that NX has generated our application files. And if we take a look at them, we can see that our main TS file has been set up to use Bootstrap application. It's using input providers from for now, but there is a PR there to use Provide Router, the Provide Router API. It's also using an app routes file, which has been set up. So we take a look at the app folder. We can see we've got our app routes, which is our entry point. It's just got a basic definition for a route array. And then our component is a standalone component which imports the router module for the router out that directive and the NX welcome component so that it can render it. So that's our application generated, but like we said, we want features, so we're going to split them into domains, and the domains can be workspace libraries. So if we use the library generator for Angular, we can make it standalone just by passing a standalone flag, and then we want to allow for written configuration to be set up, but we also want to now attach this library to our application. And we can do that by saying we want to attach it using lazy loading. And then we'll pass it a parent and we'll pass the file. So we now tell that the parent of our feature library is going to be the app routes file and NX will be able to find that and automatically insert a lazy loaded route to our, our application. If we take a look at the library first, we can see we've got our lib.routes file, and within that we've got a route set up for a feature, which is pointing to the standalone component. Our feature has a standalone component generated. And then if we take a look at our library at the app routes file, we can see that it has added our lazy loaded route for our feature automatically. And it's pointing to that constant rather than to an ng module. And that's fine for attaching domains and features to the root level application, but we also sometimes need to do even more nested child routing. So we can do that again using the same, same generator. And we just change the parent to be 
of the feature. So instead of pointing to app, uh, apps, app, my app, it's pointing now to Lubs, the feature, and the lib routes file. We run that, and it will create our new library, which is set up for standalone components. It's got our new entry point for that library. So we can see there, and it will have attached correctly to the lib routes file for our feature. And of course, this is generating standalone libraries, standalone applications, but would BIM must they not be able to generate standalone components? Which is extremely straightforward. It's just a component generator and standalone flag, and then you tell it the feature you want to attach it to. And that gets created, and we can see it in the folder structure. So it's straightforward, and then action really helps just to scaffold out this code and ensure that we follow the architecture pattern set up. So that's a quick recap of the generators we use. We use the app generator, the library generator, and the component generator. There's only three generators used there, but you, based on the flags that we passed, we were able to quickly scaffold out multiple features, multiple and erring st uh, using standalone and having taken the best advantage of all the new standalone features that Angular, uh, <coughs> sorry, Angular's offered. So if you have any questions about this, you can reach out to me and connect on Twitter. My handle's Ferry Column, or you can just find me afterwards and pull me to the side and talk to me. <laughs> Thank you.